Today we're going to be talking about pharmacodynamics, which is a little bit different from what we've been talking about previously. We have been talking about how the body handles drugs, and pharmacodynamics is concerned with how drugs affect the body. And so this is, a, in fact, how drugs affect action. Particularly in our case, we're interested in how drugs might affect behavior. So in contrast to pharmacokinetics, which is what we've been looking at, how the body handles drugs, absorbs them, metabolizes them, eliminates them, pharmacodynamics is the study of what a drug does to the body. So when the drug is circulating around uh, the body, how does it have its action? That is, what does it do? And how is it affecting uh, things in the body, and particularly in our interest, in the brain? The first thing we have to understand is there are what we call receptors for drug action. Uh, throughout the body, and particularly in the brain, there are molecules on the outside of cells that are called receptors. And it's like a lock, which a key will fit into. Uh, so a receptor is generally a large molecule site where naturally occurring compounds, what we call transmitters or modulators, can produce a biological effect. In the brain, we talked about these as neurotransmitters. In fact, you're probably familiar with some of them, like dopamine or serotonin. Well, on the surface of receptors in the brain are serotonin, dopamine, and other type of neurotransmitter receptors. When those neurotransmitters are present, then they cause an effect within that neuron. And in fact, we're going to talk about what those effects are in the next set of lectures when we start talking about neuroanatomy. So receptors are just a molecule on the outside of the cell. Again, much like a lock that you can put a key into and cause an effect. You put the key in, you can unlock the lock. There are hundreds of different receptor types known. In fact, we know that there are several different kinds of dopamine receptors, uh, just to give an example. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, neurotransmitters are those that we're mostly interested in. They can be specific to certain receptors, so only causing uh, specific effects uh, on those uh, receptor locations. It's important to understand, though, that a drug might be more specific than what we call an endogenous neurotransmitter. And an endogenous neurotransmitter is one in which is naturally occurring in the body or the brain. It's just produced naturally. A drug is uh, what we would call an exogenous neurotransmitter. That is, it is externally administered. And so sometimes they won't affect all of a neurotransmitter system, but a specific sort of subset uh, of neurotransmitter systems. So when we talk about things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or drugs that affect dopamine, they're going to affect different subsets of those neurotransmitters. Uh, what happens is drugs will actually form what we call a reversible ionic bond with a specific receptor. So they'll bind to the receptor, and then that bond will get reversed, and then off they'll go, and then that's how they'll get eliminated. When a drug or a neurotransmitter binds to a cell, there are one of three things that can occur. Binding to a site of a normal endogenous neurotransmitter can initiate a similar cellular response. We call that an agonist action. When we talk about a drug being an agonist, that means that it is acting like the neurotransmitter itself. So co cocaine, for example, is a dopamine agonist. It will affect the neurotransmitter system directly and it will also cause an increase in release of dopamine. So it's what we call an agonist action. It's increasing that neurotransmitter's uh, efficacy or it's acting just like that neurotransmitter. Uh, similarly, you can have a neurotransmitter bind to a nearby site, which will facilitate transmitter binding. It's called allosteric action. Essentially what it's doing is it's helping out the neurotransmitter and making it more effective. Uh, and so it's able to boost the efficacy of that particular neurotransmitter by facilitating that neurotransmitter binding. Again, it's not, without the neurotransmitter itself, it has no effect. It's simply facilitating that neurotransmitter. <clears throat> Finally, when we talk about binding to a receptor site, rather than uh, initiating an action like the neurotransmitter would, what can sometimes happen is a drug will have what's called an antagonistic action. That is, it will block access of the transmitter to the binding site. So it actually reduces the functioning of that neurotransmitter. So an antagonist action is one which will reduce uh, the effect of that particular neurotransmitter. So when we talk about an agonist, it's acting like the neurotransmitter. An antagonist is actually blocking the neurotransmitter. And these are very important 
concepts for you to understand when we start talking about action potentials and neurotransmitters. So to give you an idea, we can have an agonist. It's going to sit with and activate the receptor. It's just going to pop right in and act just like the neurotransmitter itself. We might have an antagonist that will occupy that receptor site, but doesn't activate it. So it doesn't allow anything to come in and function like the neurotransmitter. Now, to understand how these receptors work, we have to understand a little bit about the receptor structures. And again, we're going to revisit this a little bit when we talk about neurotransmitters. Uh, the first of these is called an ion channel receptor. And an ion channel receptor is one in which activation opens up a channel, allowing the flow of ions across a cell membrane. The way our brains work is through generating electrical activity by opening and closing ion channels. And essentially, there are ions on each side of the membrane that generate an electrical charge. It's much like a battery. Well, an ion channel receptor actually opens uh, and allows those ions to trigger uh, neural firing or to inhibit neural firing, depending on the kind of neurotransmitter it is. So for example, benzodiazepines are what we call a GABA receptor allosteric agonist. And that's a big, huge mouthful. But essentially, GABA is a neurotransmitter called gamma aminobutyric acid, which is an important inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. What GABA does is it binds to a nearby site and allows GABA to function more effectively. And essentially, it makes it more likely to inhibit uh, an action potential. So essentially, it's affecting these ion channels in a similar way that GABA does, and it actually makes GABA more effective. So it's an allosteric agonist. I know it's kind of a mouthful, but we want to work our way through these, and we'll, we'll revisit these issues when we get to benzodiazepines specifically. So what happens again is it binds to a nearby site, facilitates GABA, flooding neurons with chloride ions, which will inhibit a neural action. And we'll talk about more about that here in a bit. But the way neurons work is through a balance of different kinds of ions, and chloride ions are an important part of that. The reason uh, why benzodiazepines are so effective is because they inhibit neural activity. They're used as sedatives. They're used in anti-anxiety uh, uses, uh, what we call anxiolytic. They're used um, to induce amnesia in surgery patients. And they're used as anti-epileptics. Essentially, they're quieting down those neurotransmitters and, and they're not functioning while you're under the influence of these drugs. In contrast to that, there's a drug called flumazenil, which binds to the benzodiazepine site, but doesn't interfere with GABA. And in fact, what flumazenil does is it immediately reverses the effect of any benzodiazepine. It's a really interesting drug because it blocks benzodiazepines uh, from working at all. And so essentially, it's an antagonist of benzodiazepines. Um, and so it doesn't affect GABA, but it will reverse the effect of the benzodiazepines. And to give you a look at this, uh, it's technically a benzodiazepine antagonist, but it's used only to treat benzodiazepine overdose. And so, uh, for example, the drug Versed, which is also known as midazolam, is used in surgical settings all the time. And a lot of times anesthesiologists, in fact, I've worked with anesthesiologists, who say, well, just give patients a pretty whopping dose, watch their vital signs. If there's any trouble, we'll give them a little flumazenil, and it not, uh, brings them right back around. So it's a pretty interesting way these two drugs work together. Um, <coughs> so those are ion receptors. There is another kind of receptor uh, that's a little more complicated. It's called the G-protein coupled receptor. And what this does is it induces the release of intracellular proteins. That is, it will trigger what we call secondary messengers. And these G-coupled proteins will oftentimes be called metabotropic receptors. And what these receptors do is they control many cellular processes. So ion channel function, energy metabolism, cell division and differentiation, and neuron excitability. And so when we bind to these metabotropic receptors, we're really affecting the overall functioning of a, a cell. And so not a lot of these that we're going to talk about, we'll talk about a few of them. More often, we will talk about things that are carrier proteins. And what happens here is they will bind to a neurotransmitter to transmit them back to a presynaptic neuron. And essentially, 
one of the things that uh, we'll talk about when we talk about antidepressants is they will block these carrier proteins. So, for example, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors will block the carrier proteins for that specific neurotransmitter so they do not get brought back into the cell. And then that serotonin is available for causing a, a neuron to fire. We're going to talk more about that again when we talk about uh, action potentials. It's very important that we understand that. Uh, so you might want to make a note right here that you'll come back and, and look at this again after we've gone through uh, the brain and neural anatomy. So keep that in mind. Um, another uh, issue in the brain are enzymes that are actually right in the brain in between neuro uh, in between neurons, sorry. Uh, and what these enzymes do is they function to break down neurotransmitters in what's called the synaptic cleft, which is the space in between neurons. And so we'll talk a little bit about what are called tricyclic antidepressants, which affect the enzymes that break down neurotransmitters. So inhibition by drugs increases transmitter availability. Uh, for example, uh, to give you an idea of the use of some of these drugs that affect these enzymes, uh, what are called irreversible acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, which is a big mouthful again. Uh, these are used as pesticides and nerve gases. Acetylcholine is a really important neurotransmitter in terms of um, muscular functioning, respiratory functioning, that sort of thing. And so by um, inhibiting acetylcholine esterase, you get a lot of extra um, acetylcholine, which causes nervous twitching. These are why they're called nerve gases. And essentially, what they end up doing is causing a fairly grim and rapid death. Uh, on a much more happy note, um, melanomine oxidase inhibitors are a class of antidepressant, which inhibit the breakdown of norepinephrine and dopamine and, and therefore increase the bioavailability of these particular neurotransmitters. Okay, so that's a little bit about receptor structure. Again, we're going to revisit this a little bit when we talk about neurotransmitter, or sorry, neuroanatomy. Um, but we want to continue talking about how drugs affect the body. And one of the most important parts, I think, for you to understand about how drugs affect the body is to understand what's called the dose-response relationship. And what's happening in this particular idea is we want to determine the effect of a drug. And what we have to do is study several doses and measure whatever the change in our response is. And we talked uh, at the very beginning about how pharmacology and psychopharmacology research is conducted. One of the things we do is we conduct experiments and give participants a drug dose and measure responses. And so what we can then do is determine what the best dose is for most people. So when we talk about the relationship between that dose and their ultimate response, we call that a dose-response relationship. And oftentimes we call this a dose-response curve because there seems to be um, what we call sort of a sweet spot in which uh, we get a benefit of a drug um, and any more drug and there's no more benefit. And so this dose-response curve is very important. So let's take a look at uh, what these might look like. So for example, we have the percentage of subjects who are responding to a particular drug. We have our dose, which you know, out further out towards the right, we have increasing dose. So let's say um, we're trying to cause unconsciousness in uh, an anesthesia patient, we're, anesthesia, we're testing a new anesthesia. So we want to know at what point, what dose most people become unconscious. So here at 50%, it would be at this dose. Out at this dose, we have 100%. Now the problem is, is that some of these people who have the appropriate response that we want down here are probably going to have a serious problem with this big dose up here. So the intensity of our response is also related to that dose response curve. So when we talk about uh, understanding what the appropriate dose is, it's really important to think about this kind of curve. Now these dose response relationships have a variety of effects. So you can move sort of back and forth on this slope. So for example, 
one of my research interests is how nicotine affects memory. In particular, what happens when we take people who smoke normally, uh, smoke heavily, what happens when we take away their nicotine? And what we find then is that the nicotine levels slide backwards and their response ends up being much worse because their nicotine levels are so much lower than they're used to. So moving people up and down the slope is an interesting way to understand how drugs are affecting behavior. And so dose response curves gives us information about three very important variables. Potency, that is how well the drug molecules attach to their sites of action. So a very potent drug is going to bind very efficiently. It's going to get absorbed. It's going to all that is going to make it so that those molecules end up at their site of action and they're having an effect. So more potent drugs usually attach better than less potent drugs, called binding. They bind more tightly than less potent drugs and they stick there and have an effect. Binding is the same thing as what we call affinity. So a more potent drug has a greater affinity for its receptor. And the way you can think about this is if you think about if you had two magnets and they're weak magnets um, and you've got the poles lined up so they'll attract each other, the weak magnets are kind of going to bind to one another. But if you have very strong magnets, they're going to be very strongly bound to each other, just like that with these receptor structures. So a less potent drug has less affinity for its receptor, does not bind so tightly and can be more easily knocked off the receptor. So it's less likely to have a strong effect. So different drugs may bind to the same receptor, but with different affinities. So if you give two drugs, one drug is probably going to bind more strongly, then it's going to have a greater affinity. The second characteristic um, we're interested in is illustrated by the dose response curve slope. That refers to the most linear central part of the curve, how sharply the effect changes with each change in dose. If a small change in dose produces a large change in effect, the slope is steep. Okay. If even large changes in dose produce small changes in effect, the slope is shallow. And essentially what this is going to tell us is about how strong a drug is. That is, a little bit of drug causes a large effect, it's a potent drug. Um, so we want to look at the slope of those um, dose response curves to see how strong a drug is. The final thing we want to talk about is efficacy, and this is the maximum effect obtainable where additional doses produce no effect. And so what we want to know is what is the most efficacious dose? So drugs, some drugs may be potent, but they might never be able to produce a peak response no matter how much is given. And a drug that is more efficacious, that is more effective, can produce a greater peak or maximum effect than a drug that is less efficacious. So we're talking about pain relief. A drug like aspirin is not going to be very potent. You're not going to get a great deal of response out of uh, aspirin. But if you talk about something like morphine, you do get a huge response out of it. It's a very potent drug. And so let's take a look at what a uh, dose response curve might look like. Heroin and morphine are structurally very similar to one another, and they have very similar efficacies. Heroin is slightly more potent um, than morphine, but not a great deal so, and it's certainly much more addictive. Aspirin is much less potent. So you can see with just a couple milligrams of morphine, we get a great deal of pain relief, whereas you can go from 100 to 1,000 milligrams of aspirin and never get pain relief. And so what this shows us is aspirin has this very slope curve. The more drug you add, it doesn't do much. Or sorry, this very shallow curve. Morphine and heroin have very steep curves. So you're probably not, once you're at 10 milligrams, you're not going to get a lot more relief by going up to 12 milligrams um, is essentially the idea. Okay, so this also relates to Effectiveness and safety. So for an FDA, for the FDA to approve a drug, it must, must be both effective and safe. So it has to work, and it also has to not hurt you. And it has to work more than it's going to hurt you, or it's going to have to help more people than hurt people. So it has to be effective and safe. We're going to talk about several uh, components of this idea, which are different kinds of doses. The first is what's called the ED50, or effective dose for 50% of the population. So we go out and we do a study, and this will be the drug dose that produces the desired effect 
in 50% of our test subjects. Whatever dose that is, is going to be our effective dose, because it's effectively dosing half the people. The next thing we're interested in is the lethal dose, and this is called the LD50. This is the lethal dose for 50% of test subjects. Now, obviously, we want to try to avoid that, um, but it is an important thing to understand. This is the reason why we test this using experimental animals, uh, so we can determine what the lethal dose of a particular drug is. Now, the problem is this is the lethal dose for half of test subjects. Now, some of those test subjects, the dose is going to be lower. Some of those test subjects, the dose is going to be higher. What we become interested in then is what's called the therapeutic index, which is the ratio of the lethal dose to the effective dose. So we want to make sure that we understand what the therapeutic index is so we understand how safe a drug is because that ratio is going to tell us that information. So let's take a first look at how this might work. So we have dose response curves for lethal drug doses for, again, you can see we have drug A and drug B. So 50% of the subjects who get this dose or above die, 50% or below live. And we have two separate drugs. Obviously, um, they have very similar lethal dose, dose curves. So drugs might have many effects, and usually they're the prominent desirable response, as well as other actions that might be undesirable, what we call side effects. Some side effects might be lethal, and the dose of a drug that will be lethal in 50% of subjects is, again, called the LD50. It's important to know the relationship between the therapeutic effects of a drug and its possible legal effect. It's one of the biggest problems with morphine and fentanyl and other painkillers is they tend to inhibit respiration, which can be problematic. And so we want to talk about that when we look at other uh, specific drugs. So when we talk about the therapeutic index, we're essentially dividing the lethal dose by the effective dose. So the greater the therapeutic index, the safer the drug is, because the difference between the desired effect and the unde undesired or lethal effect is larger. So for example, if the lethal dose is 100 milligrams and the effective dose is 2 milligrams, then the therapeutic index is 50. That's pretty good, but if the lethal dose is 50 milligrams and the effective dose is 40 milligrams, then we're obviously going to have a problem. Um, and so we want to think about that carefully because then the therapeutic index is 1.25 or something. Um, so we want to think about that because this really does tell us a lot about these, the efficacy and safety of drugs. So if two drugs produce a therapeutic effect that is desirable, the better drug would be the one with the larger therapeutic index. So to be safer, the therapeutic index is actually calculated by using the lethal dose, dose excuse me, for 1% of the population and the effective dose for 99% of the population. So we would never do the 50-50. That's just an easy calculation. What we would probably do is what is the lethal dose for 1 out of 100 people? What is the effective dose for 99 out of 100 people? So the lower the ED50, the greater the potency, but the lower the therapeutic index to lower the safety. So we can take again a look at effective dose versus lethal dose. So we have an effective dose for 50% of participants at 10 milligrams, a lethal dose for 5% of the subjects at 50 milligrams, effective dose for 95% of the subjects at 50 milligrams. You can see this is the lethal dose curve, this is the effective dose curve. Um, and then all the way at 100 milligrams is a lethal dose, um, which is way beyond what we would need for any effective dose. So it seems like a pretty safe drug. Last thing I want to talk about then are placebo effects. And we talked about this at the very beginning. Um, many studies today use double-blind, randomized, controlled clinical trials. Um, however, in these, even in these trials, uh, we can end up with misrepresentations of placebo effects. Notably, uh, the placebo effect in antidepressant studies has risen dramatically between 1980 and 2000 because there's so much more information about how effective antidepressants are, and so people are much more likely to believe they're going to work. So double-blind tests with placebo run with what's called a placebo run-in period 
may eliminate much of the placebo effect. This run-in period is really interesting and a cool way to do a study because what uh, is done in these tests, every patient is administered a placebo for a week. And patients who respond positively just from that placebo are then removed from the study. So we can take away participants who are more likely to have a strong placebo effect. And the take home message is that placebo effects show individual differences and they are definitely real. Okay, this is a very quick and brief introduction to some of the issues in pharmacodynamics. These issues will become much more clear as we start talking about specific drugs and after we talk about neurotransmitters and neural anatomy. So if you're having trouble with this material, read through chapter four, which talks about uh, the brain and neurotransmitters and uh, look at the lectures there and then come back and take a look at this again. And if you have any trouble, of course, always contact me. All right, thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time with uh, brain and neurotransmitters. And neuro